because the idea that any person on earth can tell you with such specifics what happens when you die just blows my mind that somebody on earth another person can just say to you oh yes and what happens when you get to heaven yes you you'll meet jesus he's wearing a white robe there's a little gold piping on the sleeve and then you go in this room and you eat eggs and you watch f troop and are you kidding? What are you talking about? You're just a person like I am. You are clueless. You have no idea what happens. Don't you me. think Rick believes it? Of course he believes it. But how, how ridiculous is that? Like if I went to the Himalayas to find the holiest of holy men in the world who had all the answers, the guru, when I got to the top of the mountain, I said, please, Master, can you, can you help me with the ultimate meaning of life? He'd say, yeah, there's a guy, Rick, in Long Beach, uh, Rick Warren. Go ask him. He knows exactly what happens when you die. And, you know, it's, that is my ultimate message. Unless a god told you personally what happens when you die, it all came from another person with no more mental powers than you have, and you don't know. So just man up and say, I don't know. But they believe. And believe, yes. belief is a tough thing to counter. Yes, you know? and I understand why it's a luxury for some people who don't need it, and why a lot of people are less fortunate, and they do need it. Uh, so we're not trying to point fingers in this movie. I think we do it. We're laughing all the way through it. I think we're winking and having a good time, and yeah. we're not trying to be judgmental. But at some point, you know, mankind is going to have to shed this skin if he's going to move forward. I, I, I do have a, a serious intellectual problem with it. And on another level, it just ticks me off. It's just the ultimate hustle. It's just pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. You know, why can't they... I always ask, I ask Jesus in this at Holy Land, why can't God just defeat the devil and get rid of evil? You know... And it's the same reason a comic book character can't get rid of his nemesis. Then there's no story. If God gets rid of the devil, and he could, he's all-powerful, well, then there's no fear, there's no reason to come to church, there's no reason to pass the plate, we're all out of a job. You know, it's got to go on. Well, we're mostly trying to make people laugh, but I also would like to arouse the somewhat like 16% of people who I call rationalists. They would call them atheists or agnostics in America. It sounds like it's a small minority, but 16% is actually bigger than blacks or Jews or homosexuals or NRA members or teachers union, Hispanics. If those people stood up and made themselves heard, but they never do. Do you think it might be more? Do you think there are people who yes. just don't admit it? Abs you know what they are? There are a lot of people like me, like I was. We'd make a, a point in the movie to show that my evolution toward where I was, where I am now, was gradual. You know, I still had, uh, later in life, I, I wasn't a religious person. I definitely didn't believe in the Jesus story after we get the, uh, quit the Catholic Church. But I did have an idea of some imaginary man who lived in my head who got mad at me if I was bad and who I had to bargain with if I was bad. And I was always being like, oh, please, God, get me out of this. If you just get me out of this, I promise I will never do this again. So, uh, you know, it, it, it doesn't happen overnight. You have to come to it slowly. So, see, and that's another thing that bothers me about this conflict, and, and the media really is culpable about this, because they don't really examine the words that they're using. Remember a few months ago we had three soldiers kidnapped? Mm -hmm. And I kept hearing on the news that three American soldiers had been kidnapped by terrorists. Well, first of all, they're, they're soldiers. Can they really be kidnapped? Isn't that something that happens to civilians? And the words that we use to describe the people that we're fighting over there, terrorists, insurgents, the enemy, gunmen, I hear, gunmen. Well, we're kind of gunmen, too, aren't they, men with guns? I have a real problem the way Bush lumps the P. He said it recently. He said, we're, we're fighting the people who attacked us on September 11th because now they're called al-Qaeda in Iraq. Well, that's just a flat-out lie. You know, there's one thing. If you want to say, okay, there's some people, 19 guys, attacked my country and purposely hit a building with civilians in it. But now we're in somebody else's country that didn't attack us. You mean those are the same people? Those are also terrorists? Um, you know, I'm not saying these guys are George Washington or Thomas Jefferson, but in the analogy of the American Revolution, we're the British here. We're the superpower that went over to some other country. And these guys, you know, I, I, I would think if somebody came to our country and did that, we would, we would defend it the You're same way. You're not rooting for them, are you? I'm not rooting for them at all. But I'm not saying that they are necessarily terrorists. Terrorists are people who specifically target civilians. That's the definition of terrorism, especially in our country. We're in their country. Idea of a draft? 
I think it's a great idea. You do? Sure, I'm too old to be drafted. <laughs> and I think it would uh, even things out. You know, okay. Mitt Romney has five sons. They were asking him about this recently. Yeah. Why, why, if you're such a big supporter of the war, you know, if this is really a fight for our own civilization, if this is so important, how come none of your sons are going? Um, and also, I think it would get people involved. Why aren't there any demonstrations? How come I saw when the iPhone came out, I saw people who were camped out on the street for two days, <laughs> but they won't get their keisters out there to the mall in Washington to demonstrate against the war in Iraq. What Post is Obama's legacy 10 years from now? I think it's pretty damn good, you know? I mean, he... They've done a good job beating him up, though. Of course. I mean, we always knew it was going to happen. I just didn't think it was going to be this vicious. I mean, I've, I've never seen the kind of in-your-face disrespect that they gave to this president, and that's racial. I know they can, they hate when you say that, but <laughs> it's true. Um, but, I mean, I think historians will be kind to him. First of all, Obamacare. I mean, how many presidents tried to get this through? For and six we, years, then. Fred finally did it. We finally... If it lasts. Finally... It, it'll last. I mean, the Supreme Court made that ruling, and yes, there'll be bumps along the way, as there were with Social Security and Medicare and all these programs. It takes a while to tweak them, but we finally joined all the other big boy countries in the world and gave uh, make, made health care kind of a right, um, but also just the economy. You he know, staved off a depression. We, don't, we never give credit to that, do we? No, because they always say, <laughs> well, you, you know, you, nobody votes on it could have been worse. Why? Is that a concept that's just beyond the American ability to understand? Right. I cannot understand the concept of it could have been worse. <laughs> that is beyond me. Um, yeah, I mean, we were losing 750,000 jobs a month when he took office. And I think his greatest quality has been his calm. You know, I mean, I rest easier knowing that when everybody's screaming at him, you know, do this and do that and, you know, go, go put troops on the ground in Iraq again and... He's like, you know what? I don't work on your cycle. I don't work on a 24-hour news cycle. I'm going to do the right thing. I'm going to think about it. I'm not going to panic. And I remember the panic the country was in in the fall of 2008 when Lehman Brothers went down and people were basically taking their money out of the bank and putting it in the mattress. Um, you know, that calm was so important. Saving the auto industry. You know, right. Mitt Romney and others wanted to. I mean, just the psychological damage of watching GM go down, that flagship company, when somebody once said, remember, as GM goes, so goes the country. Um, huge. And overseas, you know, I think he stayed too long in Afghanistan. I have lots of quibbles. Um, didn't do anything about the drug war, but I also understand that he had so much on his plate, and you can't do everything. Certainly not. You also can't do any, everything with a group of people who won't let you do anything. That's true. <clears throat> but also, he had to wait on certain things. Um, you know, the environment, he's been both disappointing and, at the same time, the best president we've ever right. had on the environment. So, it's, you know, every president's record is a bit of a mixed bag, but I think it'll be pretty good. And he does have a way of, like, a year or two after I'm screaming at him to do something, he does it. <laughs> Not because I was screaming at him, just because he gets, around he, he gets around to it. Gay marriage, or whatever it is. And my hope is that he will leave with a speech about the environment, just the way Eisenhower did about the military-industrial complex. I would love to see him go out with that speech that says, you know what? We're not going to have to worry about all the other problems if we don't deal with this problem. Right. New rule. <laughs> no, this oh. Halloween, stop fretting that some stranger is going to put drugs in your kid's candy. And put the drugs in there yourself. <laughs> Come on, this is America. Acid will be the healthiest thing they eat all day. <laughs> Do it. Put drugs in the Halloween candy. Oh. Now, I know what you're thinking. Oh. Bill Maher, what a thing to say. We all know that too much of any drug can cause permanent damage. Just look at Rush Limbaugh. <laughs> you can't just decide to give a bunch of innocent, drug-free kids some sort of psychedelic. What if it interacts badly with their Welbutrin, their Abilify, their Adderall, <laughs> their Ritalin, and their Monster Energy drink? <laughs> yes. See? <laughs>
Oh. They're laughing. You're such a hopeless. You are. The kids are on drugs, all right. The problem is they're on the wrong drugs. They're on a combination of processed sugar, so they can be mini coke fiends, and mind-narrowing pharmaceutical crap like Ritalin that doesn't open up their minds. It levels and controls them. These drugs are all about keeping ratty children in check, or as we used to call it, parenting. <laughs> Fair enough. Mm. Yeah. Oh, okay. see, now you have to think about oh, it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. Now you think Adderall is the drug of choice these days on campus. Oh, what fun. I don't know what I'd enjoy more, the extremely focused parties <laughs> or the highly detail-oriented sex. <laughs> but here's the thing. When Steve Jobs was young, the drug of choice was acid. And Jobs told his biographer that dropping acid as a young man was one of the best things he ever did. Because when he took it with his girlfriend, the wheat field started playing Bach, which is pretty unbelievable. <laughs> a computer nerd had a girlfriend? <laughs> now, maybe there's not a connection between LSD and genius, but it's something no great American ever said about a Kit Kat bar. <laughs> if it weren't for acid, you might not have an iPod. And you definitely wouldn't have some of the best music in your iPod. <laughs> you got one there, brother. You got one there. Oh, no. Jimmy Hendrix. Oh, 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 you had to put us on this show? I'm turning them around you had now. You to put us okay, on this show? show? <laughs> Francis Crick discovered the structure of DNA while on acid. The Beatles made Sgt. Pepper while on acid. I made DC Cab while on acid. <laughs> and the list goes on and on. And it's not just anecdotal. In a study from Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine last month, scientists found that a single dose of psilocybin, which is the drug in magic mushrooms, created a, quote, long-term positive personality change in most patients. People improved in the areas of sensitivity, imagination, and broad-minded tolerance of others. In pharmaceutical speak, psilocybin is known as an asshole inhibitor. <laughs> And uh, couldn't we use a little more of that? Have you seen a Republican debate lately? <laughs> if ever there was a group who could, who could stand to take a sensitivity pill and employ broad-minded tolerance of others, it's these people. This nation faces enormous challenges, and the biggest idea we've heard from them so far was, let's build a fence that electrocutes Mexicans. <laughs> Steve Jobs literally learned to think different. And if you can get that, that insight from LSD or mushrooms, or for that matter, from licking a toad, <laughs> then bring me Kermit the Frog and I'll stick my tongue right down his throat. You know, marijuana smokers have a well-deserved reputation of some really good qualities, like being tolerant and open-minded. And These are wonderful things. I just wonder if they haven't hurt us in this struggle because we should be intolerant of the injustice that is going on. Yes. I want to Keith is right. I'm here a lot because my friend is in prison and it hurts me. Not as much as it hurts him, but it bothers me a lot. It makes me mad. It makes me mad that so many hundreds of thousands of Americans are arrested. That is a big number. If that was a disease, people wouldn't stand for it. We should be as offended as everyone else is in America for their bullshit causes. Yeah. You know, when you hear someone support the drug war, be offended. Yeah. You know, if they make a bad pot joke, that offends us. Have having a little zero tolerance. I have zero tolerance.